that, um, that they uh, really were almost doing penance. We had people really on our side. So once that muscle comes together, you know, when it comes right down to it, the David Letterman show, David Letterman has a lot of power. And on these other shows, you know, the researchers don't. So it all, you know, you got the stuff on because you were the big cheese there. We get the stuff on because we have the power. But the researchers can be really, really good and really thorough, and then the network can nix it, which is what... And just to drive this point home, the movie Armageddon had a professional astronomer as a consultant. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're uh, all the way backstage. Astronomy, right? I, and, and I don't know who it is, and I'd, I'd love to find out. <laughs> all the way, stage right, all the way at the back. I come from the corporate world, and, uh, and I'm a free market Cato guy, like, as Michael mentioned, and Penn and Teller. But I want to point out uh, one aspect of that, which I think the skeptical movement would do well to look into, the spectacular failure of corporate governance, which has come to light in recent years, has a hell of a lot more to do with a complete failure at critical thinking than it does with willful fraud. I have sat on many boards and been to many a board meeting, and I don't think I've attended a single board meeting that wasn't full of self-deception, arrogance, groupthink, knowing the answer before you ask your honest questions, having a clue about peer review, which is what a board of directors is supposed to be all about. And I think that that area might be a valuable medium for the skeptical movement to get itself out there in the mainstream. Any comments? That is a fascinating idea. Um, but Jerry, I think this reminds me a little bit about you know, the old joke about the guy who wanted to get married. And he heard that people either get married for love or they get married for money. So he decided to go to where all the rich people were and fall in love. <laughs> The problem, with, the, problem too, with this is, the problem with this is how do you get people who are not from the corporate, you know, who, who do not ordinarily sit on boards to sit on? I mean, I don't sit on it. I have a board. I don't sit on any boards. I don't know an awful lot of skeptics who have that kind of access. I would love for something like this to happen. I think you made an extraordinarily interesting point. Jerry, the problem with, with the JREF, I would certainly say, is we can't spread our spectrum too wide. We're having a hard enough time handling the spectrum of John Edward and uh, astrology and, uh, and magnets in the shoes and whatnot. And even that is a pretty wide spectrum. If we were to get into the corporate world, uh, I'd need at least two more employees and a couple more lawyers to sit at uh, and desks on either side of mine. Um, it's, it's a matter of spectrum and how much you can handle. Uh, you know, Penn and Teller and myself and other magicians, we know how, two things, we know how to deceive people, and we know how people deceive themselves. And the point is, we, that's our specialty, that's our, our, our field of expertise, and it can be rather narrow. But to get into the corporate world, that would terrify me. I'd have to have someone entirely different, preferably in a different building, who would be handling that on behalf of the JREF. My question is for uh, Michael Shermer and Randy. P pardon my voice. Probably most people here know the answer to this, but I don't. Is there some uh, schism between Paul Kurtz's organization, uh, Skeptical Inquirer, PSYCOP, and so forth, and your organizations? Can you give me some feeling on that? No, who, is that who is that again? <laughs> what magazine? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah I, I broke with PSYCOP uh, some years ago. Um, it all happened in a matter of 15 minutes or so at a, an executive meeting we were having. Um, I haven't lost my affection or my, uh, my respect for any individual members uh, in PSYCOP, with maybe one or two exceptions. Uh, <laughs> I'm covering myself here. Um, but I must say, when they told me they were being sued by Uri Geller, and he was suing both PSYCOP and myself in the same action, and they said, now, from now on, Randy, you just can't mention Uri Geller's name again. And I looked at them and it's but I said, wait a minute. We were put into action, into existence, to handle situations just like what this man has brought to us. I can't agree to that. 
And I said, if that is your decision, and they all looked around the table, they all nodded and said, yes, that's the safe way to go. And I said, I don't know the safe way. Thank you very much. I took the pen off saying executive board, and I stuck it in the table and walked out and never went back. And I had to do that. Stage left in the back. Hi. Uh, I w I did a little thing this past fall, which Randy was actually at the opening night of. Uh, we had a little show that we put on at the local theater called Raising Elvis, a Spirit Theater Experience. And we basically did a 1890s style seance where we brought Elvis back. And then we did a uh, little reveal at the end. And we ended up getting three very good articles in the local paper that were very pro-skeptic. And, uh, you know, this is more a comment, and then I'd like to have people further comment on it rather than a question. Um, it, the, the point was that Penn and Teller and South Park is exactly right. You don't get people excited about this by hitting them over the head with, um, you know, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. You get them excited by giving them an entertainment venue, which they can then say, aha, and let them have the aha moment. No, um, sure, you can hit them over the head. You can say you're wrong. I mean, I used to be a uh, very, uh, very strong liberal, and I'm now uh, uh, a libertarian, and I got it mostly from a really smart person screaming at me, you're wrong. It doesn't matter that much how the information comes, that whole, you know, honey and vinegar and all that jive. I, I don't believe any of that, you know? I just don't think that. Also, how hard is it to do a seance with Elvis? He's still alive. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Bill, don't touch the microphone. Oh, I forgot. It's a power trip, I know. <laughs> yeah. uh, the question primarily for Dr. Bob Park, but certainly uh, Dr. Platt or anyone else uh, interject, and it's a, we're moving, I'm moving to a completely different area about space exploration. And first I'd like to say robots rule. But aside from that, what is your opinion, your evaluation of when it would be the right time socially or economically to actually put a man on Mars? Good question. Uh oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can't conceive of that time coming. Close Long before we could put a human being on Close Mars, our robots will have done a pretty good job of exploring it. I, uh, it. It sort of puzzles me that, you know, scientists are accustomed to making measurements with instruments. The fact that the instrument is 100 million miles away doesn't make any difference. It's just an extension of the observer who is the scientist back on Earth. And this is the great adventure that comes in our time that you could never do before. We can explore all the places where no human being can ever set foot. That's terrific. I'm sort of turned on this uh, thing of uh, space exploration, going to the moon, going to Mars. Going to Mars, I absolutely agree with uh, Bob in every respect on that. We're nowhere nearly ready for a man to actually go, well, man or woman, uh, to actually go to Mars. Um, I was in favor of the going to the moon and landing on the moon and coming back and bringing rocks back and whatnot because I felt that the the impetus it gave to interest young people particularly in science and give it a glamour that it doesn't always have for the public was worth the risk. Since the disasters that have been happening, I've had to go more to in Bob's direction. I respect his uh, professional attitude on this thing very highly. But uh, it's a matter of, I'm sort of torn, I must say. Mars, no, I would say, personal opinion. Uh, moon, yes because I think we can do that with much better accuracy and much better chance of success. And what it will do to young folks out there, well, you're gonna see a movie, uh, a 15 minute videotape of the first card trick done in space. You'll probably see that tomorrow, I expect. And uh, that doesn't get you a little excited and certainly highly amused. Uh, uh, if I show that to young people, they go, oh, wow. And if you can get that out of young people, I think you've done something very good.